they'll claim, well, it exists, right? You're, you, you're telling me that nobody in all of church history has ever believed, you know, right. the social trinity. They're yeah. gaslighting you. No, listen, no one, no one believed it. This isn't like we're not talking past each other in this sense. You just don't know church history. Right. Like, it, it's truly considered heresy by right. anyone that was a Christian for 2,000 years to posit more than one mind and more than one will. I mean, it's just a historical fact. All right, this is Tyler Baker, pastor here in Jacksonville, Florida, and I am coming at you with another episode of the Contend for the Faith podcast. So that is official. And I guess I could consider this an episode. This is episode six, and I have a return guest, and that is... uh, John the Baptist, John the Baptist. Now, throughout this conversation, I'm going to be referring to him as Brother Gion, right? So I'm going to try not to make that mistake when it comes to the channel name, John the Baptist. Brother Gion, how are you? I'm doing good, Pastor. How about yourself? I'm doing good, man. I'm doing good. So this conversation, we kind of, we we wanted to have another episode <laughs> where we discussed some of the stuff that we got into at the very end of our uh, Really, it was episode one, our last conversation here on the channel and on the podcast, um, which had to do with some of some of the errors of independent the independent Baptist movement. And we are we are both independent Baptists, and um, there's just a few flaws, and we're going to kind of discuss those at length here. But we didn't we didn't get to get into all of those right in the first discussion. Uh, so that was one thing why we wanted to come on here. But I had pitched to you just to make it a little bit more laid back, right? And it can be just more like a discussion. So as I mentioned to you a few minutes ago, I think you said the same, uh, but uh, I did zero preparation for this. So when you when you sent me the text, like, hey, can you start in five minutes, like a little bit early? I came in here and I was like, how about 10? I got in here a little bit before that and I typed a few things up. So, it, you know, and then you told me then like, yeah, I didn't do any either. So this thing could be a mess, but we'll see. I think it'll be good. <laughs> we'll be back. We'll call it laid back, not a mess. Yeah. Yeah, laid back. Yeah, I yeah, you know, I uh, I got sweatpants on, man. I I don't have shoes on. I'm in, I'm in socks, right? I'm so, in basketball th- shorts. So this there we go. Your <laughs> basketball sh- shorts. Yeah, this is this is meant to be laid back, right? Yeah. Well, cool, brother. Well, um, so you you uh, anything new on the channel? So let's start with that. Let's make sure. I, I've been forgetting that too, by the way. Uh, please make sure that if you are listening to this video, you like this video. Drop a comment on this video, something interesting, whatever it may be, right? Uh, drop a comment, share share the video, and if you are not subscribed to the channel, do it now. Subscribe and hit the bell, because the, the, all of the, the content is gonna get more and more interesting as the channel progresses. And then, uh, Brother Gian, you wanna let them know about your channel? Yeah, my channel is John the Baptist, G-I-A-N, the Baptist. Um, I'm working on basically these days a lot of theology proper and Christology. That's pretty much what's become the main focus of my channel. Um, I used to do a lot of other stuff, uh, but I was kind of all over the place. But I think I've kind of narrowed in on those topics. Um, so I'm doing a lot of that work. I just covered some, covered this guy Young Don, who apparently mm-hmm. is like I saw that growing. Um, is a gr- I mean he's a rapper. <laughs> supposedly became a Christian a year ago or something like that, and he's. Um, teaching Arianism. So is he still rapping? Bumping. I don't know actually if he's still rapping or not. I I, I assume he is. Yeah, but, that'd be interesting. <laughs> yeah, but anyhow, he's uh, teaching Arianism at the moment, and his uh, channel is kind of popular. So I debunked a lot right. of his Arian arguments, and I have something interesting coming up in the next coming weeks as well. Uh, something to so do that- with three selves or something like that. Three selves, right. three selves, or one self, or something right. like that, right? <laughs> something like yeah, that. we might talk about that here in just a few minutes. Um, but uh, yeah, make sure maybe, Brother Gian, if you could, uh, if I don't remember to, you can uh, post a comment um, with a link to your channel. Um, right. Do they do they filter out the links? I mean, you you should be able to put them in there, right? You should be able to, but honestly, I don't know. Sometimes it seems to me that sometimes they appear and sometimes they don't. Right. Maybe I can put it in the description of the video. I'll try to remember to do that. So yeah, head on over if you haven't already and give Brother Gian uh, on John the Baptist, spelled G-I-A-N, uh, his channel. The um, uh, g- Give him a subscription there. Make sure to subscribe. Okay, Brother Gian, what we were going to talk about, as I kind of mentioned there um, 
uh, in the introduction is uh, some shortcomings when it comes to Baptists. Yeah, you know, this is an error that we, you and I, have both noticed. And and um, to to be honest, and you may be able to say the same thing. This is this has caused. Um, uh, stumbling's not necessarily the right word, but it it caused me to get into errors in a few um, locations of or, or or places in my Christian faith, right? A few areas of my Christian faith. Um, I would have been able to save some mistakes um, if I would have known some church history, and that's what we're going to talk about a little bit. So we, we, we got into church history on the first one in regards to the Trinity, right. but we wanted to talk about in particular um, later in church history, and specifically the Reformation. Mm-hmm. So oftentimes Baptists are just anti-Reformation, anti-Protestant mm-hmm. Reformation, um, independent Baptists specifically, right? Right. Martin Luther is burning in hell today, as <laughs> is John Calvin and everybody that has ever been a part of, right? right. The uh, the Protestant Reformation. But there are major inconsistencies with that position. Tremendous. Right? So, Brother yeah. Gian, throw me a couple of them. Well, I want to get to the perhaps the most obvious, because independent Baptists— of which I I'm, I am an independent Baptist through and through. I've been part of an independent Baptist church for coming up on 11 years now, the same one. Right. So I've been consistent in that regard. But one thing that independent Baptists do that irks me is they completely <clears throat> detach themselves from church history. Mm-hmm. And they kind of see themselves as a group unto themselves. Now, it's okay to view yourself as your own distinct group. There's nothing wrong with that. But when you view yourself almost as being the only Christians, there's a lot of problem with that. Yeah. Now, right. they, they, independent Baptists, we have one very obvious distinctive, which is that we are King James only, right? Mm-hmm. Um, we have this doctrine of preservation, and it's something that makes me very proud to be independent Baptist. It's kind of like one of the most things I like about the movement is mm-hmm. the fact that when the whole world became too intellectual to actually believe that God had preserved his word— it was the independent Baptist movement that continued to believe that God actually preserved his word and right. had it available to all generations, to his people. And as a consequence of that, we were King James only. Now, um, all, of course, that entails uh, believing that the word of God was preserved through the Texas Receptus. And right. we can get off into the manuscript stuff, but I don't, I don't really think that's within the scope at this time uh, to get into the particulars of that. But I bring that up to say that We believe that the word of God was preserved as independent Mm -hmm. Baptists through the Texas Receptus, right? We thought it's that stream of Greek manuscripts, particularly in the New Testament. We know that it's the Masoretic in the Old, uh, but in the New Testament, it's the Texas Receptus. And we believe that the way that God preserved it was through his people. That's kind of one of the tenets of the doctrine, right? That God preserved his word through his people. Right. I mean, that's what Texas Receptus means, received text. Who received it? It's a reference to the church. It's the received text of the church is actually what that means. Yeah. Exactly. So who who is exactly receiving it? The church, like you said. Right. It is God's people. Now, this becomes very problematic for independent Baptists when they continue to insist on separating themselves from all the church history and almost— in some more fringe circles of the independent Baptist movement, insinuate that no one that isn't a Baptist is saved. Right. Um, that you know all the reformers are, are, are unsaved heretics and that sort of thing. <laughs> this becomes very problematic when you begin to realize that it was primarily the reformers right. who were the instruments that God used to preserve his word. And even before that, a lot of Roman Catholics who had a lot of right. differences with Rome and, and had, uh, although they didn't, for example, Erasmus, that's the most obvious mm-hmm. one. Uh, he right. was a Roman Catholic, although he was uh, he had a lot of disagreements with Rome, and he was kind of mm-hmm. seen as a semi-reformer, although he had his um, differences with Luther. He was famous for having a um, ar- uh, debate with Luther via writing right. the on the bondage debate, of the yeah. will. Yeah, on, on free will versus um, mm-hmm. the bondage of the will and that sort of thing. But Erasmus was a Roman Catholic. He died a son of the church, died in good standing with the church. And yet Mm -hmm. every independent Baptist is forced to acknowledge Erasmus as instrumental Mm -hmm. in the preservation of God's word. So the question becomes, was Erasmus God's people or not? Right. Right. And and even going after him, you have all of these reformers who are the ones that God is using to make 
God's word available to his people in their vulgar tongues. So Luther uh, uses Erasmus's Texas Receptus, his first mm -hmm. edition, to make his Luther Bible um, in 1524, I believe, uh, to make it into vulgar German. Uh, then you've got uh, Beza and Stephanus, who were Calvin's mm -hmm. literal disciples. Right, uh, right. Instrumental hey, and hey, almost nobody knows that. That, that Beza and Stephanus are, are Calvin's disciples? Yeah, independent Baptists. Yeah, no, yeah. But when you bring that up, they're like a deer in headlights. They have no idea who they are. They know their names, right. and they know that these were additions that came after right. uh, but or revisions, but they almost— I mean, I've never had anybody that is aware of actually the biographies and the backgrounds. Right. So, yeah, these guys were literally Stephanus. Calvin's disciples. Yeah. <laughs> literally. <laughs> they're uh, as Calvinist as they come. Um, mm -hmm. And go, so— God uses a Roman Catholic, right, to put this Texas Receptus together. Now, understand where I'm coming from. I'm not mocking this as if oh, this can. I, I'm saying I really believe this is how God did it. Right. So I'm. This is not me as a um, textual critic mocking mm -hmm. this process. This is me as a King James onlyist, as a Texas Receptus right. onlyist, um, telling you how it is. God right. uses a Roman Catholic Erasmus to compile these mm -hmm. manuscripts together to um, put them in one edition on which we uh, we understand that he also made several additions to that. Uh, then you right. have Beza and Stephanus subsequent to him who were Calvinists to uh, purify that work even further. And then you've got the King James translators, right. which <clears throat> were part of the Church of England, Anglicans, the majority right. of which were Reformed. Yeah. None of which and, and were Baptists. And King James himself, King James himself was, being a Presbyterian. Exactly. Right? So, yeah, I mean, if we go back to the very first translation, even um, into English, that's Wycliffe, and he Wycliffe. translated from the Latin Vulgate. Wycliffe right. himself, um, you know, not you know that, uh, let alone that he translated into, uh, or I'm sorry, from the Latin, the Latin the Vulgate. Vulgate. Independent yeah. Baptists would, you know, flip their lid over that, mm -hmm. but Wycliffe was a Catholic priest. Right. He he died as a Catholic. Right. That is John yeah. Wycliffe. And, but right. people want to pr they praise God, the independent Baptist that is. They praise God for John Wycliffe. Rightfully they so. They praise God for Erasmus. Right, rightfully yeah. so. I, t I totally agree with that. But yeah. then over here, out of the other side of their mouth, they condemn the Protestant Reformation as a whole. Right. The whole thing is wicked. The whole thing is not of God, whatever language that they want to use, right? Right. Um, and uh, so there's just major inconsistencies with this. So right. even if we, we, we back up all the way to Wycliffe, the very first time that it comes into English, or like you, you said, back up all the way to Erasmus, and we see you know, him collating the Greek that ultimately, the, the Greek New Testament, the Texas Receptus, that's ultimately used to bring us our English Bible, translating Ooh. now from Greek into English, every person that was involved was a Protestant was right. a part of the Protestant Reformation. Yeah, and even going um, back to before Erasmus, like where did he get all these manuscripts from? Mm -hmm. It happened because the fall of Constantinople happened at roughly the same time. So you have right, a lot right. of Eastern Christians coming in, bringing yeah. these manuscripts. How dare you call them Christians? Oh, how dare I, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's a, yeah. It's, it, yeah, it's the Byzantine text. Exactly. It's a biz so like we believe in the majority text, but within that there is a specific stream that the right. Textus Receptus represents, which is the Byzantine text type. It's mm -hmm. from Byzantine, right? right? Like you said, these are East, these are Eastern Christians. Right. So I, I I'm sorry to break it to my IFB brethren, but it wasn't independent Baptists who came in with these manuscripts after the fall of Constantinople. Uh, right. it was Eastern Orthodox uh, right. Christians for the most part bringing in these manuscripts, which largely Erasmus was able to uh, gather from to make his edition of the received text. So going back before then, the scribes that you're thinking of, they weren't independent Baptists hiding in the mountains, and I, and I suspect right, we'll get to that right. later on. But from before Erasmus, <clears throat> right? Then you got Erasmus, then you got the revisions to the TR, and then you've got the translation to the King James itself, which was made by a bunch of Anglicans, again, most mm -hmm. of which were... Um, uh, reformed, yeah, and absolutely. None of which, none of which were Baptists. Understand, not even right. Reformed Baptists at the time. When I say Reformed, oh, they were Reformed proper. Mm -hmm. By the way, yeah, I'm gonna. Some independent Baptists are really gonna. Their minds are gonna explode right now when I tell them this. The, uh, every single one of the King James translators was a baby baptizer. 
Every one of them. Every one Every. of them. So uh, we have uh, the very first Bible, you know, that's translated into English, John Wycliffe. A lot of people don't know much about John Wycliffe, but they know that he helped uh, to preserve and to bring uh, the the English Bible to us today, right? right. But John Wycliffe was a Catholic. Right. John Wycliffe, although he he of course had major differences, and, major, and some of it is recorded in history, right? There are mm-hmm. major differences with the Catholic Church, but nonetheless, he was a Catholic, right? right. Uh, Erasmus, like you said, um, he's who collated. Uh, if we kind of work down the timeline, he's who collated the the Greek New Testament for us. He was a Catholic, and even insofar as he criticized, as I'm sure you're aware of, Martin Luther for separating himself from the Catholic Church. Yes, he did. He did. Yeah, Erasmus had this was one of his criticisms. Of course, they argued, they debated, and you can read that. That's available about mm-hmm. the it, Martin Luther's writing The Bondage of the, the Will. Bondage of the Will. Yeah, and 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 Erasmus responded to that. Um mm-hmm. but they they um went back and forth and Erasmus criticized Martin Luther particularly about his Reformation separating the church, right? Him causing right. division within the church of God. And he thought that, and referring to uh, the Catholic Church, he thought that any Reformation that should take place should take place within the Almost church. Ended. Correct. Yeah, and he, you know, he didn't want to just totally fracture the church. Correct. And, and even, so when you think about someone like Wycliffe, um, he himself remained part of the church, although he was preaching a lot of these doctrines that would eventually right. be staples of the Protestant Reformation, such as um, the, the priesthood of the believer or justification by faith. That That's a super good point, uh, Brother Gian, that we see multiple times throughout church history with people that are a part of the what we would call as the Catholic Church clearly – uh, uh, teaching dissenting and positing. Right yeah, they're dissenting, you're right, but they're right. positing while a part of the Catholic Church, justification by faith alone, mm-hmm. right? Um, the priesthood of the believer, for example, mm-hmm. just all these doctrines that we would think of that are, um, you know, uh, just juxtaposed to the Catholic Church. Juxtaposed to the modern iteration of Catholicism. And, and exactly. the reason I say that is, the reason why they, these um, differences were even possible to exist, and, and you have people like Wycliffe uh, dissenting um, and teaching justification by faith or the priesthood of the believer, is because a lot of times Rome did not define doctrine. So Rome's doctrine on soteriology, for example, was not defined until the um, the Council, Council of Trent. The Council of Trent, correct. That is when they dogmatically defined that justification is by faith and works, and that's when they anathematized the gospel. Uh, right, and, which was the – yeah, if people aren't familiar with it, that was the response to the Reformation. That was the purpose of right. the Council of Trent. Yeah, it's called the, it, it's also known as the Counter-Reformation. So um, yep. it's not until the 17th century – sorry, the 16th century in response to the Protestant Reformation that Rome defines a lot of the doctrines that is definitional, definitional of her, uh, such as justification. They anathematize the gospel literally. Uh, if you believe by right. justification by faith – Without works, you are anathematized, according to the Council of Trent. Now, um, so all that to say this, there were people, since Rome's doctrine was not defined, there were people who had a lot of this different views within Rome prior to that. Um, and, and Now, one, one of my favorite people from church history, since we touched on Wycliffe a bit, uh, it's somebody who he influenced, a bohemian uh, named John Huss. So right. John Huss was influenced by the movement that was started by John Wycliffe, and he's a, another example. He ended up being martyred. He's another example of someone that was within Rome, was not trying to start off his, his start his own movement or split off from Rome necessarily. He wanted to reform from within. But just like Wycliffe before him, uh, roughly the same time period, but um, uh, Jan Huss is preaching justification by faith, priesthood of the believer. Right. He's calling for moral reforms within the church as well um, because he's operating under a time when there's like three different popes at once. It's called the Babylonian captivity of the uh, of the papacy where there's like, there's the Avignon pra- papacy. There's popes in France claiming to be the pope. There's a pope in Rome claiming to be a pope. There's all different types of popes. Right, and they're all right. very corrupt uh, human beings. <laughs> yeah, um, right. To, to, to put it lightly. Um, but in any case... He's obviously uh, martyred. He dies by being burned. Um, 
And it's actually a fascinating story, uh, one of my favorites from church history. But all that to say that there are people constantly throughout the history of the church, of what will be known as the Roman Catholic Church, who are dissenting, and even people who are not necessarily dissenting, because a lot of times Rome hasn't defined a lot of doctrines. So presumably there can be people who believed in justification by faith alone um, without even being persecuted for a lot of that history. Right. Right. Yeah. You have another example, too. Uh, so you know, if we like kind of it, it continue walking down the timeline, uh, Tyndale, Tyndale, if you watch any documentary about the King James Bible, you read any book, um, they're going to praise Tyndale as well. He right. was a Catholic. He was a Catholic priest specifically, once again. So um, we have just over and over again, starting all the way back. Um, so w Wycliffe is is the late 14th century. Um, mm -hmm. You have Jan Hus late that 13th. came after him. Uh, I think it was like 1382, wasn't it? So it would be 14th century. All right, you're correct. Sorry. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, I just looked it up. It was, I think it was yeah. 1382 because I was comparing it to Tyndale when he lived. I was kind of looking at the um, – right. uh, so uh, you have Wycliffe at the end of the, the 14th century. Then you have Jan Hus with his life overlaps, right? right. Then you have uh, Tyndale because I was thinking how close is Tyndale to Wycliffe. That's why I looked up the date of both of them. And Tyndale – is here at the end of the 15th century. He's a contemporary of Luther's, yeah. Right, he was a contemporary, right, exactly. Yeah, mm -hmm. so the, yeah, you have, then you have Luther, uh, mm -hmm. all of these people are in are a part of the Catholic Church, Catholic monks, Catholic priests, Erasmus included, and they are pushing for, Erasmus as somewhat of an exception, many of the doctrines that we would hold to today as Baptists, right? right? Priesthood of the believer, uh, justification, excuse me, by faith. Um, what were some scriptura. of the other doctrines? Yeah, uh, the what'd you say? Sola scriptura. Sola scriptura. Yeah, exactly. That's another good one. Right. Yeah, they were. So this is happening within the Catholic Church. The whole reason that that a lot of people don't understand that the that the Reformation occurred was because the Catholic Church, um, which in time past was a bastion of Christian faith was apostatizing more and more as time went on. And thus yeah. it met a head while mm -hmm. those who were uh, uh, true believers and saints within the church, they begin to oppose this apostasy as it right. continues and to push back. And what you see is, you know, the, the, the tension breaking at the Protestant Reformation. Right. Where they continue to veer away from uh, biblical Orthodox Christianity and all of those that still clung to and held to um, uh, the, the faith, the true Christian faith, they were within the church uh, still, and that's when the the Reformation, the the protest begins. Correct. Right. So th they never saw themselves initially. Luther was hesitant to break away. Um, he right. didn't break away. Actually, he was anathematized. Yeah, yeah. He was kicked out. He was excommunicated. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so it wasn't even his decision. He even Luther thought of himself as someone as someone who was reforming from within. Right. Um, so it was not their intention to break away. A and even if you see some of the writings, for example, from uh, Luther and Calvin, um, they still considered Rome a legitimate church as far as it contains legitimate Christians in it. Obviously, they thought the right. Pope was literally the Antichrist, mm -hmm. but <laughs> yeah. they did believe yeah. that there were many saints still within Rome. Right. Right. Now, obviously, you said uh, it's 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 good to kind of reiterate and to make sure that we clarify to the viewer that um, the Council of Trent was, was a major turning point. Truly, it was. Yeah, yeah. Uh, this was a, a digging in of the heels into a false gospel. Yes. The the Council of Trent. If you kind of want to uh, just explain a little bit of what is in re pertaining to the gospel in particular, brother Gian, the uh, what the Council of Trent stated. So basically, it it got every single point that anyone who believes in justification by faith would make, and it anathematized it from every single possible angle. I mean, they go out of their way to say some of the craziest things. So, like, mm. um, I don't have it in front of me right now, but when they even say, if anyone believes that works do not add to your justification, not merely that works are a proof of the justification, but if yeah. anyone denies that works are not necessary to add unto your justification let him be anathema <laughs> right it's so like you know, it's like it's like almost ad nauseum the way that it clarifies yeah. you can it's like comical. you can like yeah. uh, you can almost like see the hatred oozing from the pen <laughs> right right 
Yeah, yeah. Uh, so the Council of Trent is just where w- w- it's it's really the beginning of what we see today, of what we think of today, that is, of the Roman Catholic Church. Because when you say Roman Catholic Church, of course we think of a uh, uh, false religion. Uh, and, and that's not to say there, there weren't a lot of things that the Catholic Church had picked up that they were wrong about before that. Of course. Right. Well, we're not, here's what we're not saying. We're not saying that the Catholic Church was like a great church or anything like that. Right. That yeah. Yeah. That, always, yeah. So that's like, right. What we are saying is they were always true Christians within Rome. And right. And a lot of times what people misunderstand or don't really get is they will just take Rome's claims and believe them. And I'm talking about right. um, anti Roman Catholics, but a lot of times take Rome at her claims. So Mm -hmm. they think of Rome as being this perpetual institution that has always been exactly as it is right now, or exactly Mm -hmm. as it's always been in the 20th century or whatever, when that is not in fact the case, right? They had to define their doctrines as they went about. Um, If you were to ask somebody, a Roman Catholic from, say, from the time of the Avignon papacy, or or that period that we were talking about where there were Mm -hmm. three different popes at the same time, uh, and you were to ask them, hey, what about the infallibility of the pope? Not a single one of them would have even known what you were talking about. That was a doctrine that wasn't defined much later until Vatican I. Yeah. So, um, so understand, like when you're talking Rome's definitional doctrines, a lot of them had not yet been hashed out. And so right, that, that's, right. What somebody, that's what you need to keep in mind when you're thinking about Rome in the you know, 12th century, Rome in the 11th century. A perfect century. example, I think, of this that will help um, that will help that, that helped me understand it a little bit more as I studied church history is to look at the the nation of Israel as they go through perfect example yeah yeah as, as they as they move through um, the the cyclical nature of serving God and then falling into apostasy God you know delivers them and or or just even how they pick up traditions as time goes on like if right. you're familiar with um, you know I took a, a a Western history class and uh, that dealt with a lot of the different elements of Western culture culture in in college, and it taught about like the origination of monks in this, mm-hmm. um, and it was like in I think I believe it was the the seventh century uh, when it was like ratified, right? It was a part right. of the Catholic Church. I mean, it's late. Right. Yeah, it's pretty late. Yeah, and yeah that's when yeah. they kind of became the school the the schoolmen of of the church, right. or, or basically of Europe generally, because the university right. system had not been uh, been invented just yet. Right. But yeah, I mean, a lot of these developments were late. That's the point. So yeah, yeah, first, and, and they and they were and they were progressive and progressive exactly. So in that vein, actually, um, this is why Rome herself has had to invent this doctrine of man. I forget it's, the name slips me at the moment. Um, but it basically, it, it's almost, uh, like th- th- there was this guy, Cardinal Newman. Um, he had to invent this doctrine. So w- w- one problem they have is that if, talking about the perpetual virginity of Mary, for example, or the bodily ascension of Mary, uh, ascension of Mary, mm-hmm. nobody, you can't find a, an example of anyone believing that for like the first five centuries of the history of the right. church. So what somebody like Cardinal, Cardinal Henry Newman is his name. He developed the seed hypothesis is that what it is something like that i've never yeah yeah i'm not sure well basically what he says that well yes it's true that a lot of these are not found in the early church but they were there in in seed form and uh, so okay they were they've always been there but they've been there in seed form and in the church had to allow it to grow this infallible doctrine that nobody said they believed but it was there in seed form right. and so right. as time progressed it began to bloom and now we know the doctrine that has always been true although not always really known. And so that's kind of the approach they've had to take uh, in light of the fact that history bears witness to the fact that a lot of their doctrines that are definitional are simply not uh, believed by anyone in the first few centuries of the church. So even Rome herself, uh, when you're talking about her her, um, apologists and theologians, they are forced to recognize this. So, right, yeah. It, obviously, if they're given defenses for it, they're they're yeah. having to answer for the fact of the absence of particular doctrines that that we consider to be staples or essentials of Roman Catholicism. They didn't exist in the early church. Correct. So, right. uh, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, no, I, I was just going to make a statement about uh, we were talking about Martin Luther earlier. Um, uh, so how he didn't he himself didn't see himself or didn't desire to leave the church 
either. And, he, and there's a very famous quote from Martin Luther where he said, I didn't leave the church, or I don't know if he actually said Catholic, but I didn't leave the Catholic church. The Catholic church left me. Yes, yeah. Right, so, so that was the view. So he believed this is Martin Luther living in the 16th century. Uh, mm-hmm. He believed that the um, that the Catholic Church had apostatized. That's the reason right. why he reformed, right? And that what the Catholic Church uh, believed in times past, from his perspective, was different than what they believed during his life. And that's the reason why he went against it. Correct. So this is a good point. Luther and the reformers all viewed themselves as being more consistent with the early church fathers than Rome at that time. Right. So they were often appealing to the church. So you, if you've ever uh, read Calvin's Institutes, you'll see how often he's referring back to the early church fathers. And for anybody who might be uncomfortable with me saying that, what I mean by that is just the colloquial term. They're known as the early church fathers. That's what they're called. Right, right. I'm not calling right. them my father. But right, anyhow, right, you right. will often... Yeah, that anybody hey, could. Brother, it's and ridiculous say, that you even have to explain that. It is ridiculous that I have to explain It really that, is, yeah. yeah. Somebody's uh, going to clip this and say, John the Baptist is a Roman Catholic now. He's a Roman him, Catholic, yeah. He calls him and his father. Okay. <laughs> That's right. But anyway, That's right. Yeah. <laughs> but anyhow, you'll see that Calvin is often quoting the early church fathers to make his case, talking yeah. a- about you know justification, talking about a lot of doctrines of grace, which some of them we would obviously disagree with. But the mm-hmm. point being, is that they're often going back to the early church fathers in support of their views against Rome. So they viewed themselves as being consistent with a time before Rome, but before the status quo of Rome in their life, right. in their lifetime. Right, exactly. Yeah. yeah, so yeah, so all you know, our Bible today and every English Bible that came before it, that it that is I'm you know referring to the King James Bible, our Bible that we have today, the King James Bible that we use, and every English Bible that came before it, that the translators say, Hey, this is diligently compared to the former translations. They're referring to all of those English translations. Those are all Protestant. They're, they are a product of the Protestant Reformation. Those that participated in it were all Protestants. Yep. Yeah, Wouldn't you agree no, with that? Yeah. Yeah, there's no yeah. way around it. It's just a fact right. of history. <laughs> it's just a fact of history. Not only that, um, the, the, the first English version that was translated into English uh, was, was from the Latin, from the Latin Vulgate, and that was from a Catholic priest. And you say, well, I mean, who is this heretic? Well, that's, mm-hmm. that's Wycliffe. Right, that's John Wycliffe. Oh. Right, uh, um, we have Tyndale's work later that he did. Um, he was a Catholic priest, right? Mm-hmm. So, at, at really, when it when it comes to the English Bible, every ounce of work that was put into it of what we have today was from the Protestant Reformation. Correct. Completely, and and you think of um, the the Greek the the work from the the Greek manuscripts, as you said. If somebody wants to talk about that. Right, it was collated by a Catholic priest. Mm-hmm. You got to come to terms with this, right? So, so those are the facts, right? So, right. What, what, what to make of them, right? Right. Yeah. Because, I mean, you just got you got to accept this. You have a Protestant Bible, the King James Bible, the James is a Protestant is a Bible Protestant that you Bible. use. It is a yeah. Protestant Bible. So, right. what do you do with this information? Right. Now, the doctrine we believe in necessitates that it is God's people who are the stewards of God's word, and therefore the tools through which God preserves his word, right? Exactly. Just like the Jews were the Oracle uh, had, had um, um, uh, to them were entrusted the oracles That's of God. That's exactly the point I was getting ready to make. That's a great point. Right. That, that, that the Jews um, had that responsibility and that privilege from God mm-hmm. to preserve mm-hmm. his word in this. And that's why, for example, we accept the old Testament canon that we do, right? Cause it is the right. Jews. We will understand they apostatized later, but they had God used them to establish that canon. Uh, they were the the institution through which God was going to preserve his word and n- nothing right. was going to get in the way of that. Similarly, that is the responsibility of the Christian church in the New Testament. So God uses his people to preserve his word. We are entrusted right. with the oracles of God in the New Testament. So now this begs the question, why is it that God didn't use the people hiding in the mountains right. <laughs> right. to bring the King right. James Bible? Right. Exactly. Guess- yeah. I guess we could get a, a little bit into the um, the trail of blood theory here. Yeah, and and like like you said, I guess it's good to throw this out there too. Like you said on the first um, episode, the f- the first discussion that we had, 
excuse me, obviously there were fellow brethren that were being persecuted by the church that were coming in and out of the church. There were right. Anabaptists that weren't a part of the church, right? We're not denying that, that you know, that that, that existed. Right. However, they did not preserve the Bible. That's that's you know, there was a there was a particular institution. Correct. Historically, that it is just a historical fact that preserved the Bible. Right. That we have today. I want to go off on a little tangent because I'm afraid I'm going to forget it. But uh, and and I know Do we're it. not going to forget about coming back to this. <laughs> but it's the whole idea of Anabaptists at the time of the Reformation. Okay. Yeah. So a lot of our independent Baptist brethren don't like the reformers because they accuse some of them of having murdered Baptists. Um, they will just say things like John Calvin killed Baptists, which he didn't kill a single one, by the way. That's just not true. But they will correctly say that some Lutheran states drowned Anabaptists. And the problem, here's the, the issue with that. While that's true, there were some Anabaptists that died at the hands of Lutheran states, um, not necessarily by Luther himself, but by uh, states and, and um, countries that had adopted, uh, well, yeah, states within Germany that had adopted Lutheranism. What you have to understand, here's what independent Baptists do, or what Baptists in general do. They'll hear the word Anabaptist, and then they'll, um, um, and, uh, they'll assume that, that, that they were Baptists just like we are. Right, right. They'll anachronistically uh, impute <clears throat> Orthodox Baptist doctrine onto those Anabaptists that were drowned. Right. What you have to understand is at the time of Luther and the Reformation, you had this group of people called the Anabaptists, which by all accounts, the only thing we would have in common with them is the fact that we baptize adults. People are nuts. You're talking yeah. about people that deny the Trinity. Um, right. Poly- the, the majority of them were heretics. The vast majority of them were heretics. The, they That's really not to say were. That some of them were not orthodox. As yeah, a matter some of fact, some of them were. You know, there were some of them in history that were. Right. Zwingli, for example, um, earlier in his in his uh, in the in the Reformation, was very sympathetic, mm-hmm. and a lot of people suspected he was a Baptist. Uh, he right. later changed his views. So there were Orthodox Baptists among them, but there were the majority of them were these radical. They were referred to as the radical reformers. Um, right. Because they did not only want to reform on certain aspects, such uh, like the like Calvin and Luther did, for example, uh, they actually did, for example, wanted to just get rid of the Trinity. Uh, that's one right. example of their unorthodox right. view. Right. A lot of them were, were basically Arians. Yes. The majority of them were Arians. Yeah. Um, so you have this famous uh, tale, or it's not tale, it's a famous hist- uh, story from around the time of the Reformation um, called the Siege of Munster. Where I'm not sure if you're familiar with the story, are you? Mm-hmm. Yeah, where a bunch of Anabaptists uh, took over the city of Munster in Germany. Mm-hmm. They killed all the Roman Catholics, women with children, and everybody. Um, it was a, a brutal um, takeover of the city. They sieged the city, so they were inside of it for, I believe, seven years. And for seven years, it is the most outrageous story you can imagine with people setting themselves up as kings and prophets. They're literally become full Pentecostal. They're hearing from God. One guy kills the other guy, says God told him to kill him. He takes over. He's the new king. He takes his wife. He takes everyone's wife. They're uh, they're in, uh, practicing um, polygamy. Um, all sorts of crazy things. At the end, they all end up dying. A lot of them kill right. each other, and, and eventually you know, they're uh, you know, the siege ends, right? They're right. Uh, defeated. But that is an example of the type of Baptist they're dealing with at the time. They're not dealing right. with, you know, your, you know, with me. There's you your forefathers. I. Right. Yeah, I'm right. sorry. <laughs> yeah. I said, there's your forefathers. Yeah. Speaking right. to, yeah, the man that wants to claim uh, the, the Baptist trail of blood. Right. Now, here's the thing. I don't have a problem with people that believe the trail of blood. I mean, that's not, I have a lot, I have landmarkist, uh, brethren in my church. I don't have a problem with that. The problem, I think, if you believe that there's been some si- some sort of uh, Baptist perpetuity, okay, I don't see, there's no evidence of that. And and here's, here's the thing. When Baptists insist on having this perfect perpetuity of doctrine going back, in a lot of ways, they are admitting that if such is not the case, then everything we believe is invalidated. Um, right, it's almost right. like they have a so- similar view to Rome. Yeah, they have they have a bad. They, yeah, they're they're starting wrong. Like the you could tell that they ju- they they have an assumption that there must be a group of people that believe just like me all throughout church history. I mean, it, it's clear, and it you you know, 
um, the I under, I can I can sympathize with that idea to a degree. Obviously, we want people to be like us. We want right. to find <clears throat> somebody who believes like us. Right. I know why they do it, but it's it's just not historically uh, you know accurate. Right. It, it, you would be arguing from silence. I guess it's technically possible. But the re- reality is that church history is much messier than that. Um, it, that it, and that's it, the truth. Uh, the right, trail that, of that blood goes. Truth. Yeah, it is. It church is history the is neither the way that the Roman Catholic presents it. Um, that's laughable. And it's not the way that some uh, landmark is Baptist presented either. Um, you're Absolutely. making an argument from silence. You don't know. I mean, there's no records to substantiate the claim that there's always been independent Baptists hiding in the mountains. And if there were, that's kind of embarrassing, actually, if you think about it. That's right. who we were. Yeah, yeah. And and like the point that you made um, as well about uh, who had the Bible. Right. Right. Who so it's the- preserved <laughs> unto all generations. Now are we to, you know, obviously there are other passages like in Isaiah as well where, that speak to preservation and that he says, you know, my word, it's not going to depart out of thy mouth, nor out of the mouth of thy seed, nor out of the mouth of thy seed, seed from henceforth, saith the Lord and forever. The reference is to God's people. Right, yeah. so from generation to generation, God preserves His word to His people. Well, well, who had the Bible? Who was preserve? Who had access to the Bible? Who was preserving? Who was God using to preserve His word? And quite frankly, it was those that we would consider the Catholic Church. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, that's undeniably. that's yeah, undeniably, yeah. That, what that forces you to do is to uh, reevaluate what you believe about this, uh, what is called the Catholic Church or the Church in general, right? Right. right. Um, perhaps it's not as clear cut as you thought it was. Perhaps right. they haven't all been uh, Pope Francis. And that's one of the things that um, um, mo- yeah, most people aren't aware of too. Is they 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 see the Roman well, Catholic Pope Church Francis is today. very liberal. He's not really a Catholic. I have to uh, I have to be at least be fair there. Right, right. Who's, a, who's more of a real Catholic? Trent Horn. Trent Horn is actually the baby. He's an right apologist. Right now. <laughs> People probably don't know who he is, but yeah, right, he's okay. a Roman Catholic, Catholic apologist. Apologist. Who actually believes Catholicism, unlike the Pope. Right, right. right. Exactly. Yeah. They, they think that the Roman Catholic Church, how it in its current state, is how it has looked for you know, you know, two thousand years, and they almost grant to uh, to the opposition that is to the Roman Catholic Church of today its right. its perpetuity that they're fighting yeah. for, that it has perpetually existed all throughout church history. Right. So, so the so they grant Rome all her claims, uh, and yeah. basically what they end up doing is like, yeah, that's true, but I also have my alternate little universe where that's true of me too. <laughs> right. We were right. Right. Mountain. Yeah. We have a yeah, perfect exactly. line going back to John the Baptist. He's called John the Baptist, not John the Catholic, right? Yeah, there you go. Um, yeah, yeah. So you think of like the advantage that we're handing over to them. You know, we, yeah. we give them all of early church history, right. but, and then we say, we come to the table and we say, you know, yeah, we realize that you've existed for 2,000 years uh, <laughs> as a Christian church. It's like, but actually we're the true church. Right. And yeah. then we have zero paperwork to put on the table. Right. Because no yeah, evidence, no period. evidence, and we've ceded all the evidence to them. Uh, we've accepted their lie and created right. a new one in the process. <laughs> it's it's it really is ridiculous, it, and it has to do with um, uh, the we talked about this also in the first episode, uh, the Baptist pride, right? Mm-hmm. And I'm thankful for independent Baptists. I am an independent Baptist through and through. So another thing that Baptists. Um, will because we're we're not aware of the beliefs of other denominations. We don't study church history. Um, we, you know, we're not wise enough to keep our mouth shut. We then start making claims about other denominations and church history that aren't factual, right? And one right. of those um, we've talked about before is the topic of paedo baptism, right? And neither yeah. one of us, which is you know, uh, uh, paedo referring to child, like uh, you know, and Baby baptizers today, according to a Baptist, um, they're all in hell, right? And right. always have been. Yeah, this is something you see a lot. Like if any any time that someone makes an appeal or uh, to someone in church history or to basically everyone in church history agreeing on a certain point, people from our camps would just kind of brush that off by saying, well, they're all baby baptizers. And what that's right. supposed to mean, the implication there being— they're all in hell because they're being baptizers. So right. they don't, a lot of independent Baptists don't understand the doctrine of paedo baptism, right? There is a crude 
work salvation form of it, namely the Roman Catholic Church. But they don't understand that there's distinctions between people who baptize babies. So, for example, the Presbyterian Church, right? They are baby baptizers. They're pedo baptists, right? But they do not believe that it is salvific at all, right? They be- they baptize their children because they believe they're part of the covenant. They view it as a covenant sign. Now, obviously, we will disagree with that because we right. are they, they, Baptists. Yeah, we so believe they believe Baptist. in covenant theology, and right. they and they believe that uh, as the new covenant people, that baptism is the new covenant um circumcision yeah right and just as all of israel was a part of it and uh you know the covenant in in the old the old covenant that is and they were to circumcise their children that's what they you know they kind of carry that over obviously it's ridiculous you know we're, that's why we're not pedo baptists but right nonetheless they do not believe that it's salvific as you right. stated they do not believe it's salvific they believe in justification by faith alone they do not believe right. that baptism um, is necessary for salvation or anything like that. They do it, as right. you stated, uh, for a covenant sign. Um, and so Baptists will a lot of times ignorantly just believe that anyone who baptizes a baby uh, must be in hell because they believe in work salvation or something like that. Um, and this really goes into something you alluded to, which is that Baptists in general don't know anything about what anyone else believes. Like So you, embarrassing. You go to the average person in the pew in an independent Baptist church, and you ask them, what does a Presbyterian believe? Not even not, not just people in the pews. You ask the average independent Baptist pastor, yeah. what does a Presbyterian believe? What does a Lutheran That's true. believe? What does a Methodist believe? They cannot tell you. They don't yeah. know. Or they'll, they'll describe some absurd straw man. Um, and, and so this That's this typically is, what they would do. Right, right, right. They will pretend to know, and then they'll say something that's completely inaccurate. That's something right. else they might do. And what this is really is a result of the fact that we don't have dialogue or discourse with anyone outside of our own little caps. And it comes and it comes back to having the ego. It comes back to having the, the ego. The reason why right. we separate ourselves is because we don't think anybody else is good enough. Right. Now, <laughs> th- th- there's a there's a, a proper um there's separation can be done in a proper form, right? I mean, we, we right. should have our own churches. Obviously, we can't have a church with a Methodist or with a Presbyterian. There's too much difference there. Right. Yeah, yeah, of course. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. So define what we mean by separating, right? Right. Uh, but, so I, I'm not saying um, that I'm going to, you know, join a Presbyterian church or that right. I should, you know, I should uh, attend a Methodist church sometimes and a Presbyterian church sometimes. You know, um, doctrinally, there are there are large enough differences where I att- I will attend a Baptist church, but that's right. also not to say that I do not have fellow brethren that Correct. are Presbyterians, right. fellow brethren that are Methodists. That's the point of what we're, you know, st- so most Baptists, in the sense that I said it a moment ago, they separate themselves from dialogue right. because they completely separate themselves from any kind of fellowship. They right. won't, They don't even deem, um, you know, these other denominations uh, worthy of conversation. Right. And when you or, speak to an independent Baptist, they just, with a hand wave, while not while being completely ignorant about what they believe, they dismiss everything. Yeah, they, they really do. And this was not, if you look at the inception of the independent Baptist movement, this is not how it was. Um, right. You think about the broad movement of fundamentalism, which is how, which is where the independent Baptist movement came out came out of. Right. Um, namely, the Southern Baptist uh, Convention is where they came out of, but also as part of this fundamentalist movement initially. The fundamentalists were comprised of Baptists and Presbyterians and Methodists. So right. you had these three different groups who came under the banner of fundamentalism when modernism started to uh, take over in the institutions, and they were working hand in hand. So, for example, you got guys like John R. Rice, which every independent Baptist re- uh, has respect for and reveres. He was doing evangelistic meetings with Bob Jones, who was a Methodist. Um, right. And with Billy Sunday, for example, who was a Presbyterian and other, but this was common back then. They did not view each other as a uh, being from the devil, right? They had differences. They all went to different churches and they understood, Hey, at some point, you know, we, we can't really worship together because we defer too much in this aspect or in this aspect, in this doctrine or in this doctrine. But ultimately we are our brethren. You're my brother in Christ. And we will come together um, to uh, fight a, a, a bigger fight, right? To, to, you know, to, for a better cause, for a bigger cause. Right. They worked together. They were in dialogue. They were in discourse. They were arguing, they were debating, they were talking, they were amicable, all of these things. And as a result, 
the independent Baptists of 1920 was a lot more theologically literate than right. I hate to say than our the current iterate the, the current uh, iteration Form of, of it. Baptist. Right. Yeah, yeah. So you have, um, f- for example, uh, when the fundamentalist movement began, a lot of people are totally unaware of this, but it, it was against. Uh, a, a liberal Christianity that was cropping up, right. and when when we say liberal Christianity, um, referring to doctrinally liberal, right? right? Not in practice. So they were right. rejecting uh, the virgin birth. They were rejecting the deity of Christ. Things of this nature. Well, the, the fundamentalist movement was a response to this, and yeah. uh, if we look at the fundamentalist movement, there was a particular book. Um, that is, that I guess you wouldn't call it a book. It was a it was it's ninety essays that was published. Okay, and I'm, maybe maybe it's considered a book. I don't know what they would refer to it as, but it's called the fundamentals. So all of those that were a part of this movement, this is what's considered the basis of the fundamentalist movement. Um, the fundamentals, a testimony to the truth, and generally referred to simply as the fundamentals. And I'm just reading from Wikipedia. I just pulled it up just now. I couldn't remember all the details mm-hmm. about it, but I knew enough. It says it is a set of 90 essays published between 1910 and 1915 by the Testimony Publishing Company of Chicago. It was initially published quarterly in 12 volumes, then republished in 1917 by the Bible Institute of Los Angeles as a four-volume set. Now, if you pull this page up on Google, if you'd like, um, whoever the listener is, you can scroll down to the bottom, and it tells you who the fundamentals essays were written by and the arrange the arrangement of the original 12 volume set volume one volume two volume three i challenge the person that listens to this to start clicking on some of these names because they are not all baptists a lot of them are presbyterians so the fundamentalist movement actually began many people are totally unaware of this uh with Baptist and Presbyterians, which have historically been, and when I say historically, past you know three centuries or so, um, mm-hmm. have historically been an Anglo, you know, American English uh, 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 civilization, conservative Christian groups, right. right? Baptists and Presbyterians. Whether people are aware of this or not, those two groups are ha- have been close in fellowship. They have um, they have been very similar in doctrine in ways. Of course, there are varieties of both. There are uh, varieties of Baptists that are Reformed Baptists that would be more similar to a Presbyterian. Mm -hmm. But nonetheless, Presbyterians believe strongly in the fundamentals of the faith, so much so that they were a part of the fundamentalist fundamentalist movement. I think Philip Morrow is is one guy. It's a lot less common today. Um, There's almost no such thing as a Methodist that actually believes the Bible today. Exactly. But back then, it was a lot more common. They were Methodists who were fundamentalists. Right, exactly. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So uh, you know, somebody wants to check that out. That's pretty interesting. So the fundamentalist movement itself, like we say, we're independent Baptists, right? And we're aware that, hey, you know, uh, you can't just detach yourself from uh, history, right? We, we, you know, the independent fundamental Baptists uh, stand for the fundamentals. What does that go back to? Well, historically, it's a pushback against liberal uh, Christianity that started to pop up in the um, the modern era, and you know, I guess we're moving now into people say the postmodern era, but in mm-hmm. in this this age, so fundamentalism was you know a a, a, uh, a uh, something that went on with Baptists and Presbyterians and other denominations. So one of the dangers of cutting yourself off from history is that you kind of reject all of the categories and the metaphysics that christians created that christians made and all their Mm -hmm. language and terminology um or you don't even really reject the terminology what you end up doing is you hijack the terms and redefine them through your modern Mm -hmm. conceptions your modern metaphysics your modern categories and a perfect example of this would be something like the hypostatic union where Mm -hmm. you have people (laughs) who will say they believe the hypostatic union but they come to completely redefine it so the the right. classical definition of what the hypostatic union referring to Christ's two natures and how they come together in one person. They're inseparably united in one person. He has the human nature that is totally and completely and fully and truly human. And then he's got truly the divine human, nature, yeah. which is right. truly divine. So, and the classical understanding has been 
that each nature maintains its properties. So right. the human nature is always human. It's completely human. And the divine nature is completely divine, meaning it is, remains right. immutable. It remains eternal. It remains right. simple and all that, all those classical categories. And right. they're united inseparably, distinct, but not separated yeah. in, the yeah. one, in the one person that is Christ. That is what the hypostatic union teaches. You right. Make really, what they miss too is the 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 hypostatic union um, is approached because obviously um, uh, God being the the creator, the the realities are the same, and it's approached the same way. Uh, that is as the Trinity, the way in which we think of the categories of the Trinity, the, the uh, being and person, namely. So there is there is one God, there is one being. There is one nature, but there are three distinct persons. Right. And these three persons, they are distinct, yet they are inseparable in right. the one being of God. Correct. It's the exact same thing when it comes to the hypostatic union. Right. So it, it, it's, I guess it's not, um, it, uh, it's not surprising that the people that would misunderstand the, the Godhead, the Trinity— and you know, and they would also that they would that same group would also misunderstand the hypostatic union, right? And the reason I bring up the hypostatic union is um, because Jonathan Shelley uh, from the new IFB, who I have famously covered, um, he put out a video recently where he's talking about three self theory versus one self theory of the Trinity. And in that video, which I'm going to review, he claims that he believes in the hypostatic union. So he's using the term hypostatic union, but what he believes is that he he, don't, he rejects the hypostatic union. The hypostatic right, he does union not believe the hypostatic union. That the human union. nature retains all of its human properties. Right. But what he teaches, and what the new IFB teaches generally, is that the human nature has God DNA in it. It has God right. the Father's DNA. Okay. So that is not the hypostatic. That is monophysitism. That is an ancient heresy right. known as Eutychianism or monophysitism. And so, but he's saying he believes in the hypostatic union. Now, um, the reason I bring this up, this is a perfect example, because when you reject church history, when you detach yourself completely from all of history, you end up not only using the same, you uh, redefining the labels, um, redefining the classical uh, labels and phrases. In, when you redefine it to mean something new, such as, well, God, uh, Jesus being God means he has the, God the Father's DNA in his flesh. You don't think of all of the, po all of the consequences of such a, such an absurd statement. So mm -hmm, right. I wrote, I've said this in the past. The new IFB are the only people who can at this be at the same time <laughs> polytheist and modalist. At the same time. And partialist too. Right. And the reason I say that is because when you say, for example, that Jesus Christ had God the Father's DNA in his flesh, well then doesn't that just end up being the father in the flesh? Right. But exactly. Course, yeah. They don't even think that through. They haven't yeah. gone that far. Because they're yeah, reinventing the theological wheel. And why yeah, is it? Because they're not looking at the wisdom of prior generations. They reject all of it. And right, so exactly. They'll, they'll, they'll take the labels, right? They'll take some of the labels. And then they, claim, kind of like, kind of like the, like landmarkism, right? Uh, they, right? They'll claim, well, it exists, right? You're, you, you're telling me that nobody in all of church history has ever believed, you know, right. the social trinity. They're yeah. gaslighting you. No, listen, no one, no one believed it, Right. The, the, you, can, you, you can't find anyone that – I mean that's why it's referred to as the classical orthodox trinity. It right. is the classical traditional historical view. Right? Right. You, you're conceding. When you call my view the classical orthodox trinity, you are conceding to the fact that this is what the Christian church has believed for 2,000 years. That's what right. you're saying. That's right. why people titled it as much. So nobody's gaslighting anyone. No one has believed the social trinity. No one. Right. It's, it's yeah, and the same believe. thing is true of the hypostatic union, like you were saying. The, you, you're using these terms. You know, you're using the phrase holy trinity. You're using the, the, the trinity shield, the shield of Athanasius. But all of that is classical orthodox trinitarianism. All of it. All, all of, of it. the creeds. All of it. Correct. You can't, you can't find anyone that, that taught more than one will in the Godhead. Right. I mean, it is truly considered – this isn't like we're not talking past each other in this sense. You just don't know church history. Right. Like, it's truly considered heresy 
by anyone that was a Christian for 2,000 years to posit more than one mind and more than one will. I mean, it's just right. a historical fact. Right. And so in the 6th or 7th century, there was a ecumenical council known as the third, I want to say the third council of Constantinople. Now I'm bringing this up. I brought this up in the prior podcast as well, but I'm bringing it up again. And, and I'm, I want to be careful to say when I bring these councils up, I'm not bringing them up as authoritative, but what I am trying to show you is that there was something that was commonly believed by the majority at the very least, you have to say the majority of the Christian world. Right. Because right, right, right. Of course. A, it's literally an ecumenical council. Mm -hmm. right? I mean, the council of, the, the, the entire Christian church, ecumenical. The, right, right, right. Order. And let me and, throw this out there. I don't want to. I don't want to to derail you real quick. But let me throw this out there because obviously the responses will be to pull out, you know, some quote from like some complete heretic, right? Yeah. <laughs> uh, I think you pointed this out before that it's. You know, you, I'm not going to give a disclaimer to everything, right? Of course, Jehovah's right. Witnesses exist today, and somebody right. could quote them later on as, "Hey, this is Orthodox." You know, Christian. No Orthodox Christian believed, posited more than one mind, more than one will. So I just wanted to give you know clarification yeah. on that point. Right, and actually, I can't think of any example. Not even there was no heretics running around saying that. The, the polytheism well, I, 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 was. I'm just covering myself, brother Gian. I'm sure you you understand yeah, no, I that. Mean, <laughs> like, I've been looking into this stuff for a while, and I don't. Yeah. You don't find almost anybody. Uh, I mean, the people who said it were saying it because they didn't believe Jesus was God. The Arians right. were saying that he had a different will. That's because they didn't believe he was God. So mm -hmm. they did not. They believed that there were that the Son uh, from before his incarnation, because they did believe he was um, God's first cre uh, creation from before right. the creation of the world. Uh, but they believed that he always had a different will. He always had a different right. mind. Um, but that's because he wasn't God. You see, right. so it was an Arian argument to say that there was different wills between the father and the son now um, exactly. getting back to the the council of constantinople in the seventh century third council of constantinople um what it the conclusion it came to was that jesus christ had two wills the reason they said he had two wills is because they realized they, if there were heretics at the time known as monothelites meaning one will they believe christ only had one will and so the problem with that is, and the problem that everyone recognized that that post was that it would make the father and the son, their wills to be at odd with one another, because clearly that's the case, right? Such as the in the garden right. of Gethsemane, for example. Yeah. Um, so if you say he only has one will, which you have just done, and everybody recognized this as a problem at the time, you've just said that God has more than one will. Right. If you're going to say that Christ only had one will. And if you recognize his deity... And he has a different will from the father. Well, now God has multiple wills. That's a problem. They have to call right. a council over these right. heretics saying they were, they were monothelites. And the conclusion, right, of that council was proto, that no. Proto Christ, new IFB. Right. They were proto new. I guess that's who they'd be pointing to. That we were the monothelites. Yeah. Okay, fine. Uh, yeah. You could you claim the monothelites if you want to. But what what ended up being the, the result of that council was they were saying that each one of Christ's natures has a will proper to its own. So right. um, there is a will of the human nature and a will of the divine nature, which is the same will as the father's because they are one in essence or one in nature. It's the same nature as the father's. So yeah, that was a good, but all that to say that that was the common confession of the majority of the known Christian world. And so um, truly it, this idea that God has more than one will, that the Trinity is three different minds, like uh, I guess putting it roughly would mean that they have three different brains, right? That's right. That's what yeah. they're saying, essentially. Um, three different spirit brains, I suppose. Um, that is foreign to Christianity. That is not a Christian belief. Right. Completely foreign, yeah. And um, I totally agree with the uh, will being attached or associated with being, right? right. I, I, I being believe, I can't remember, but I think we touched on this um, last episode, but I can't remember. Uh, yeah, but yeah, th that's it's the desires of the flesh, as right. Scripture states, right? So mm -hmm. that that's what that will's coming from, and it's pr so preposterous to me that the one passage that they'll attempt to turn to to demonstrate that Christ has a distinct will from the Father is a passage wherein Christ is in the Garden of Gethsemane, and. He is clearly struggling 
Right. He's <laughs> he's he's struggling. Now, obviously, um, when I say a distinct will from the Father, I'm saying they they attempt to demonstrate that he has a distinct will from the Father within the Godhead, Correct. within the Trinity, right? But but Christ in this case is struggling with following through with with God's will, following through with his Father's will, with, with right. uh, uh, going to the cross. Obviously, it's external temptation. It's not right. internal. Mm-hmm. But but nonetheless, it's the it is it's the uh, the the desires of the flesh, you might say. Correct. Right. Yes. Yeah, so well, if you were to apply that to Christ's deity, you would have to you would have to say that something, uh, you know, in line with this uh, would occur also in eternity past. Right. <laughs> if, I mean, think about that. You'd have to. Yeah. I mean, yeah. What to even say? I mean, but but this is what ends up happening. Right. When you just reject all of church history or not even that, because you don't even have to. Re- it's not even about church history. It's just like, are you aware of what other Christians believe? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> right? right. Exactly. Right. But that, that's the thing. When you don't actually have dialogue with anyone, you just have your own little echo chamber. Right. That's a, a recipe for heresy. It Obviously, really is. Yeah, there's that's no one a there good... to check you. <laughs> yeah, there's that's no a good way to put it. It is a recipe for heresy. Right. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, the Trinity. What else is there? Any other anything else on the the menu for a discussion? Like I said, I typed a few things up, and I think that's the the last thing that I had. What about the three self, one self? You know, what are you, what are you three self or are you one self, brother Gian? I would say I'm one self. One self, right? According to their definitions, I'm definitely one self. I mean, look, here's the thing about that, and I'm going to get into this when I cover that on my own video. Um, yeah. But it it, dep- be, here's, it depends how you define these things. Yeah, that's the why problem is they're exactly. using phrases that are not Christian phrases. Mm-hmm. One self, three self. That's not anything that any Christian came up with. As a matter of right. fact, the person that wrote that article was a Unitarian, Dale Tuggy. I'm right. not sure if Shelley's aware of that, but it was Dale Tuggy, a Unitarian, who, by the yeah. way, is going to debate James White shortly on why Jesus is not God. Right, right. That's the guy who wrote your article. Three self, right. one self. Those are not Christian categories. So, right. so I'm, yeah, def- it depends how you define it. Now, by the definition of that article, um, I already kind of looked at that. I think I would fall into the one self category by the definition right. of that article. But it, but here's the thing in that article. And I'll get into that. They lump in a lot of different groups um, and, and I'll, I'll I'll cover that thoroughly. So, no, I won't even use those labels because um, they're not because Christianity doesn't labels. use those labels. Right. Christianity. We, we yeah. Labels. Right. Yeah. I will say God is one being. Right. This one exactly. being has three persons, three persons in his one being. And we do see the three persons um, saying I and you. Absolutely. And there's interaction, there's fellowship. But this Absolutely. is occurring within the one being of God. So right. I, I'm not going to use labels that are not labels that Christians made. So, <laughs> right. Yeah. So is that it? Any last words, Brother Gian? Any other um, topics you can think of? Um, I thought of something and then it slipped my mind, um, but I guess not, brother. Okay. Well, you are. I guess you're technically my my your returning guest, but you're your second uh, my returning guest. So I had brother Bruce Gore on uh, last night, and I'll probably be releasing this thing uh, next week. So. Uh, I'll, uh, everybody can look forward to that. So uh, by that point, they will already have seen the podcast with brother Bruce, but, um, I feel Hold like, on, let, let me, let me say something here in closing. Cause I, yes, sir. A lot of Go people ahead. are going to see this or their heads are going to explode. And they're not going to know what to make of it, but what's the point? Mm-hmm. What I mean, what are you saying? Calvinists are our brothers and sisters. Yeah, actually I am saying that, but what, what do I mean? What is the, the, the conclusion or what, what do I want you to see that perhaps your narrow way of viewing things is not correct perhaps if god used calvinists and i'm just using them as one example right because there's other groups involved but that seems to be the the one that i think that independent baptists have the most interaction with if any so i'm I'm using them as the example if calvinists were instrumental in the preservation of god's word then maybe they are god's people too and you can have disagreements with them certainly i have great disagreements limited atonement is in my opinion is a terrible doctrine. Yeah, it's yeah. horrific, and I don't think the scripture teaches it whatsoever. Um, yeah. But you can have disagreements with people and not discard their Christianity, 
Right. That, because when you do so, we see what happens. You reject not only them, you end up rejecting like all of your Christian heritage and everything, you know, like, st- words like the Trinity, for example. Right? right. It wasn't independent Baptists in the mountains who came up with that word. It wasn't independent right, Baptists right. in the mountains that said came three up with persons. persons. Right. Three yeah. persons and one being and one essence. Right. Okay. Um, but the point being is that once you go down that road, um, you stop interacting with these people. And now your theology ends up suffering as a result. Yeah. Because what ends up happening, it's not because what they think probably is that, well, no, I'm going to stay away from the, that, the, bad, the bad doctrine. No, you end up staying away from any, you know, from sharpening your sword, from any exactly. debate, from any constructive criticism that can possibly Thanks, yeah. help you to, you know, get your doctrinal ducks in a row or to um, define it further, to get it, to make it better because you're not engaging. Right. Right. And so your sword gets dull. That's actually what ends up happening. What ends up happening is not that your doctrine gets purer, it's that it gets worse to the point right. where you start saying that Jesus Christ had God the Father's DNA in his flesh. And in fact, he always had a body of flesh from eternity past because he was always the son of man. Uh, that, right. You know, that's what ends up happening. That's really the reality. So right. I think a good way to look at it is uh, uh, different tiers of doctrine. So like tier one, uh, the, the fundamentals of the faith. Uh, which would uh, determine, you know, Orthodox Christianity would be like believing the gospel, faith right. in Christ, right, is what saves. But it, within tier two, we would get into how we understand salvation, mm-hmm. right? As far as like how salvation works its way out, how does how does God work within salvation? So salvation is by grace through faith alone. We both tier one would, right, would would identify that. Right, that's the fundamental, and, of course. That's right. the fundamental of the faith. But we might have a different understanding of how God works that salvation out. Right, there are secondary issues. Like secondary issues, like limited atonement, for example, which we right. would reject wholeheartedly. Right. right. I adamantly disagree with limited atonement. Um, but nonetheless, that's not to say that someone doesn't have faith in Christ and a robust understanding of justification by faith alone, even. Uh, however, when they get into the intricacies of how God worked out that salvation, we would disagree with a couple of things here and there. But that is still a brother in Christ right? that still has his faith in the same Savior that I have my faith in, even so much as understanding uh, the doctrine of eternal security mm-hmm. and so forth. Right. And if you don't and, recognize that, and why is it that people like that were used to give us the King James Bible? I mean, because right, that's exactly. just a fact. So, yeah, coming coming full circle, we started talking about the text and the King James, right. and we're kind of ending it that way because that is kind of uh, the Independent Baptist is forced to struggle with this. Uh, they kind of avoid it, it. It really is like when you when you ha, independent Mister Independent Baptist, or I guess Miss Independent Baptist, whoever's listening, when you go to church this Sunday and you have your Bible sitting in your lap, just know that it was a product of the Protestant Reformation. A lot just of the know that the that translators, yeah, just know that the translators that, that translated that were all Protestants. And, right. and, and furthermore, everyone that, that had their hand in it when it comes to those words being co- you know, coming into English were all a part of the Protestant Reformation, all of them. Right. right. Down, down to all the hymns that you sing on Sunday. Yeah, exactly. Right, the exactly. overwhelming majority of of the hymns in a Baptist hymnal are going to be from the Protestant Reformation. Um, right, and exactly. most of them, for example, you'll have even Luther's hymn in it. Uh, a mighty fortress is our God. Is right. in most of those hymnals. That's written yeah. by Martin Luther. So, yep. All that to say that to view the Protestant Reformation as Satan's work or something like that, or people that that were involved in it, or the pioneers of it. We're not right. Christians. That is ridiculous on its face. And even the way you worship today is, right. you know, you are you are contradicting that right. by the way you worship. Yeah, Using absolutely. The Bible that was produced by the Protestant Reformation. Singing yeah, that's the, the per- They were written <laughs> by those right. that were Protestants. That really is the perfect place to end it. Just the King, the King James Bible, Independent Baptist being King James only. The King James Bible is a Protestant Bible. You know, you you have to reckon with that in some way or another. Right. Yes, yep. sir. 
All righty, Brother Gian, I appreciate it once again coming on, and uh, I'm sure it won't be long. You didn't get to crash the studio, man. So we, we had planned it. Uh, yeah. but, uh, it'll happen soon enough. It'll happen, it'll soon, happen enough. soon enough. Right, right. So, um, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll have you on either way. I'll have you on again, I'm sure, uh, in the near future. And we'll discuss something else where we can, we can, uh, pee somebody off about some other topic. So Absolutely. God bless you, man. Thank you. God bless you too, Pastor. Take care.